Hi, thanks for joining me. We're going to talk about the changes to Article 230 in the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code. Article 230, of course, covers services. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name's Ryan Jackson. I uh, teach seminars, write textbooks, do things like that about the National Electrical Code. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. There's my email address, ryanjackson618 at gmail.com. Now, before we get started on this, I want to make it very clear that this is very, very early in the game to be talking about code changes. So today is June 15th of 2019. The actual 2020 NEC will not be published until sometime in September of 2020. So this is somewhat preliminary. Some of this stuff could still change. And the only way it would change is through what's called a certified amending motion. Uh, by the way, there are no amending motions to Article 230 this year, so that's not going to happen. Or if there's an appeal made to the Standards Council. And without getting too deep into that, suffice it to say that that is very, very unlikely. So here in mid-June, uh, we have a pretty good idea of what the 2020 code is going to say. And nothing in Article 230, in my opinion, uh, is going to change after this. So everything that we're going to be talking about today uh, with almost 100% certainty will be in the 2020 version of the code. So starting with 230.46 splices and taps. And by the way, the reason I chose Article 230 to talk about is because over the last few code cycles, Article 230 really hasn't had very many changes. Uh, in the 2017 process, I think we changed uh, 230.10 to make sure that you can't like hang your service disconnect on a tree. <laughs> so, you know, in case you were doing that, you can't do it anymore. And then I think in 230.66, we introduced the concept of uh, field labeling of meter socket enclosures and making sure that meter socket enclosures were rated for the current of the service. But aside from that, nothing else really happened in 2017. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head that was interesting in 2014 either. So it's been a while since Article 230 has had many changes, but boy, did that trend ever change in the 2020 code. There are some major changes in Article 230 this go around. So let's get started with 230.46, splices and taps. The rules for power distribution blocks were relocated here and new listing and marking requirements were added. Okay, so the general rule is this. Service entrance conductors can be spliced or tapped in accordance with the typical splicing rules in 110.14 and Article 300. All right, so these conductors feeding this house are either a service drop, and if they're a service drop, then they're, they're not covered by the NEC. So if they're a utility wire, they're not covered by the NEC, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If this was, you know, if, if it was, uh, I don't want to say a customer-owned transformer, that would be pretty unusual for residential. But if the utility decided that they were going to stop out at the transformer and you were responsible from the transformer to the house, if that was the case, then these overhead conductors are service conductors and they're regulated by the NEC. A lot of people think that you can't splice service conductors, and that's not true. It never has been true. You can absolutely splice service conductors. How would you make this connection if you couldn't splice service conductors? You know, these are service entrance conductors coming out of the house, and they're spliced to the service drop or to the overhead service conductor. So you can splice service conductors, that's fine. Here's what changed. All splicing devices for service conductors now have to be listed. And power distribution blocks, like the one in the photograph, have to be marked suitable for use on the line side of service equipment or similar. So it might be a little bit hard to see, but right here is a mark from CSA, Canadian Standards Association. And that is a listing mark. It's only for Canada. But if there is a little U next to it, like United States, then that would say that this is suitable for use in the United States as well. So splicing devices now have to be listed. That was not required before. 
a lot of people think that everything has to be listed, and that's not the case. Uh, there's a lot of things in the NEC that do not have to be listed, but splicing devices for service conductors now must be listed products. And for this particular type of product, a power distribution block, it has to be marked suitable for use on the line side of service equipment or equivalent. The idea here is that if this has a fault and it's on the supply side of the service, this is going to be ha this is going to have to carry the short circuit current for as long as as is necessary for the utility over current devices to open. When it's downstream of the service disconnect and we have a fault, our breakers or our fuses open quickly and we don't have massive amounts of current subjected to these parts for very long at all. But on the supply side of the service, we don't regulate how quickly the utility over current devices open. So this might be seeing thousands of amperes for significantly longer than it would downstream of the service disconnect. And that's why it has to be marked suitable for use on the line side of service equipment. Now, that actually isn't new. It was found in Article uh, 314, I think, I think it was in 314.28, if I'm not mistaken. So, but that only applies to large junction boxes. And it was also found in Article 376 for metal wireways, or what we often call gutters. Uh, but it was relocated here, which was definitely a good move. The other thing that changed in this section is effective January 1st of 2023, all splicing devices must be marked suitable for use on the line side of the service equipment or equivalent. Now again, we're in Article 230, so let's make sure that we're talking about conductors under the scope of Article 230. It's not every splicing device, it's splicing devices for service conductors. So if these conductors are regulated by the NEC and they're on the line side of the service, then these splicing devices have to be what? They have to be listed. And in three and a half years from now, they'll have to be marked suitable for use on the line side of the service or equivalent. The next change is in 230.62, guarding of service equipment. The rules for guarding service conductor terminals were relocated here from 408.3. This really isn't a, a change per se. They just moved this from Article 408 over to Article 230, which is probably appropriate. Article 408 covers panel boards and Article 230 covers services. Well, this is unique to services, so it probably should be in Article 230. So 230.62c says that any uninsulated, ungrounded conductor terminal or bus bar in the service disconnect must have a barrier covering it to protect those that are working on the equipment. Okay, this is my service disconnect. It's important that we understand that. So right there is how I shut off my service. That's my 200 amp breaker or whatever it might be. You can see back here, we've got the green screw, the main bonding jumper, which is only at the service disconnect. We've got a grounding electrode conductor, which you know, generally speaking is only at the service disconnect. So these are my terminals for the service conductors. The idea here is if I have to work on this panel board, I shut off the breaker, the panel board itself is de-energized and everything downstream of it is de-energized except for these two lugs that are staring me in the face. The only way I can de-energize those is to call the utility and get a scheduled outage. So in order to comply with OSHA and NFPA 70E requirements for safe work practices, I would actually have to call the utility and schedule an outage anytime I had to do anything in this panel. Well, let's just be honest here. Uh, a lot of electricians, unfortunately, are not going to do that. So what would they do? Well, you'd have these unprotected, uninsulated terminals staring you right in the face, and they would work on it energized. And if you drop a screwdriver or anything goes south, you'd be in a, 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 in a real mess. So this was added in the 2017 code. And personally, I think it was a great change. I think changes like this are, are really what the code is all about. If you, can, if you can make people safer with you know $2 worth of plastic, I think that's a great code change. This uh, is obviously Square D's solution. Uh, these little holes right in the middle allow you to put your test leads in so that you can test it for voltage or the, or the lack thereof. 
Uh, this one is Eaton Cutler Hammer, similar approach. So barriers, covers, something that cover the terminals that the service conductors land in. Okay, getting into the big changes here. 230.67, surge protection. Uh, this one I found very surprising. A surge protection device is now required for all dwelling unit services. Well, there you go. <laughs> that, that's the rule. You, you got to have a surge protection device now for all dwelling unit services. All services supplying a dwelling unit must have a type 1 or a type 2 surge protection device as part of the service equipment or immediately adjacent to it. Okay, so this one is a type 2 surge protection device, as we can see. And what a type 2 SPD means is that it's suitable for use after the service disconnect. A type 1 surge protection device is suitable upstream of the service disconnect. So it has to be either a type 1 or a type 2 surge protection device. And again, it has to be part of the service equipment. So part of the service disconnect or right next to it immediately adjacent to it. So if it's in the service equipment, it might be a type one if it's installed before the breaker or fuse. If it's installed afterward, it would be like the one in the photograph, a type two surge protection device. So I've got to have a surge protection device for all dwelling unit services. Uh, the reason that this was put into the code is according to the code making panel, we depend on sensitive electronic equipment a lot more in our homes today than ever before. And it's not just, you know, our TVs and computers and things. Uh, it's our smoke alarms. It's AFCI circuit breakers, GFCI circuit breakers. These things have sensitive electronic components. And if we have a surge, one surge from a utility or maybe a lightning event shouldn't wipe out our smoke alarms in our house. So in order to protect that from happening, to prevent that from happening, we have this new rule 230.67, which requires a surge protective device. You can love this rule or hate this rule, but I really like the way they approached this new subsection D, which addresses replacements. So a surge protective device must also be provided when the service equipment is replaced. It's always difficult when you deal with existing situations. What, how much does the code apply? When does it apply? What do we have to do? Love this rule, hate this rule. The worst it can be is silent, and it's not silent. If you replace the service disconnect, you have to install a surge protective device. So this rule applies not just on new installations, but on replacements as well. I think that's probably true whether this section really says it specifically, but it does avoid any sort of argument. If you're doing a service change, you've got to install a surge protective device. 231.71, maximum number of disconnects. I'll tell you the truth. This is the one that, that really shocked me. Uh, everybody has been talking about 230.85, and we're going to talk about that. But the one, in my opinion, that is significantly bigger is 230.71, maximum number of disconnects. The allowance of up to two to six service disconnects in one enclosure is gone. So to me, this, this is a big, big change. There are a lot of panels that we've used for decades that are not going to be allowed to be used in the 2020 NEC. And by the way, this is not just for residential. The surge protective device thing, that was just residential. This is not. This applies to commercial as well. So here's what it says. Unless allowed in 230.71b, each service must have one disconnect. That's it. No more than one. Walk up to the building, one switch shuts it off. That's a big change. <laughs> so quite literally since 1897, the first edition of the code, we've been able to have more than one service disconnect. This is absolutely new territory. Now, just so we're on the same page, if I have a disconnect for power monitoring equipment or a surge protective device, ground fault, uh, ground fault protection of equipment control circuit, uh, these things, uh, power operable disconnect, these are not considered service disconnects. So, you know, if, if I have uh, 
power monitoring equipment in my panel and it has its own little shut off that that's fine that doesn't count okay so again back to the rule one disconnect per service except each service or each set of service entrance conductors allowed in 230.40 exceptions 1, 3, 4, or 5 may have up to six disconnects consisting of any combination of the following. But here's the thing. You have to be careful. This is not getting you what you, what you might think. Let's look at this service really quick before we read item 1. I've got a service lateral that comes up through this conduit and I've got my, my uh, CTs inside here, right, for the metering. We go through this wireway, and we serve one, two, three, four, five, six individual disconnects. That is still okay. I can have separate enclosures with a single disconnect in each. So I still comply here. I've got six disconnects, but I can't have more than one service disconnect per enclosure. So six enclosures, each with a maximum of one disconnect. That is still okay. Much more commonly, what we're going to find is a panel board with a single service disconnect in its enclosure. So a main breaker panel that's your service disconnect, right? That is allowed. Or item three, switchboards with a single service disconnect in each vertical section if there's barriers isolating those sections from each other. Okay, so maybe on this one, I come in and I've got my uh, utility terminations here, and then I've got one service disconnect in this one, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here for a total of six, and I have barriers installed vertically that separate each of these vertical sections from each other. That is still allowed. So I can have that. By the way, the concern here and why they removed this is for the safety of electrical workers. If I'm in a panel board that has six service disconnects inside one enclosure, if I ever have to work on that thing, once again, I need to call the utility and schedule an outage and I won't be able to have the guards over the terminals like I had in 230.62c. So that's the idea. This is to increase the safety of electricians. So if you're standing in here, you can work on here. Now, this is difficult because the NEC and the folks that write the NEC, they're not advocating energized work. Let's be clear on that. Uh, the people on Code Making Panel 4, which regulate Article 230, actually, I'm sorry, they changed it to Code Making Panel 10, um, they are very much safety oriented. They're not making these rules so that you can work on stuff while it's hot and not worry about it. That's not the case at all. You still don't work energized, right? There's only two times you should be working energized. One is if you're measuring for voltage or, or lack of voltage because you're troubleshooting, you know, you're measuring current, something that has to be done while it's on. Or number two, if shutting it off actually creates a greater hazard than working it energized. Um, you can't shut off the fire alarm panel for a high-rise building. You know what I mean? If something went wrong, we could have thousands of, of dead people. So there are instances when you can work energized, but very few and far between. So I want to make sure that we're clear on that. The other time that I can have multiple disconnects is for switch gear. And by the way, let's push, push pause here. If I have switch gear as my service disconnect, be very careful because it has to be marked as suitable for use as service equipment, S-U-S-E, and most switch gear is not. So be careful with that. But switch gear, or more commonly, meter centers with service disconnects in individual compartments. Okay, this is a very common site, at least in my area, for multifamily dwellings. This is a set of five townhouses plus one house meter. So here's my six meters, here's my six disconnects, you can't use that piece of equipment anymore unless there were individual compartments for each individual service disconnect. And I can tell you from experience, this does not have that. 
So how would you solve this in the 2020 code? You would have to have a disconnect installed upstream of this panel. So in my area, this is a really common panel board for service disconnect for a house. And this would not be allowed anymore. This, uh, this panel is just prohibited, can't use it. So this is a 400 amp service. You'd have like two 200 amp breakers down here feeding sub panels and then uh, maybe you know an air conditioner and a detached garage, something like that. Uh, very common panel board. Uh, this is not, you've, I, I don't wanna speak for any manufacturers, but th this is not gonna even be manufactured anymore. Uh, any panel board like this, you can't use it because it's got one, two, three, four service disconnects in one enclosure. So the issue again is you'd have to guard all of this equipment. So unless you call the utility, you're going to have energized components inside of this equipment. You can't shut these bus bars off inside this panel unless you call the utility and they remove the meter or disconnect the conductors. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want to have to call the utility to, to, to schedule an outage in order to work on a panel. All right, moving along. 230.82, equipment on the supply side of the service disconnect. The list of equipment that may be installed before the service equipment was clarified and expanded. Okay, so there's a list of things that you can put on the supply side of the service disconnect. Uh, current transformers, PT, you know, potential transformers, a you know, couple little things, meters, obviously, you know. Uh, item six is solar systems, PV systems, or wind, energy storage, fuel cells, you know, interconnected electric power production sources. If they have a disconnect that is suitable for use as service equipment, and overcurrent protection in accordance with part seven of this article. So if my solar system here, my PV system, connects on the supply side of the service equipment, so these uh, PV conductors over here, they terminate upstream of the service disconnect, is that a violation? No, you can have a PV system installed upstream of the service equipment, but it does have to have a disconnect that is listed as what? Suitable for use as service equipment. So this guy right here would have to be marked by the manufacturer as suitable for use as service equipment. And we'd have to have overcurrent protection for these conductors in accordance with part seven of the article. We also added a new item 10, and I'm going to skip that because it, it addresses the next item we discussed, 230.85. Uh, so I'm going to skip item 10 and go to item 11, which is listed meter mounted transfer switches rated up to 1000 volts if they have a short circuit current rating equal to or greater than the available fault current, which I mean, that's always required, right? 110.10 says that, so you know, kind of some extra words there. But a listed meter mounted transfer switch. It has to be capable of transferring the entire load, and it has to be marked meter mounted transfer switch. and also has to be marked not service equipment. So what we're talking about is this guy right here. So it's an interesting piece of equipment. Some people have strong feelings about it. I, I really don't. I, I've never installed one myself. But here's the idea. You call the utility, they take out the meter, you slide this apparatus into the front of the meter, and then they put the meter back in. And you plug into it, and it acts as a transfer switch. So it transfers the load. Uh, the ones that I've seen are all manual transfer switches. So they're now allowed on the supply side of the service disconnect. There were quite a few changes in the code to address this piece of equipment uh, in article 700, 701, and 702 as well, which is emergency, legally required standby, and optional standby. And what's interesting, is, <clears throat> pardon me, the listing for this piece of equipment, according to UL, it actually, they say that it is, it's utility stuff. It's under the control of an electric utility and it is not regulated by the NEC. That's actually what UL says in the product standard. So in this section, we've made a rule saying, hey, you can put that upstream. Okay, cool. Uh, really, 
<laughs> it's not covered by the NEC, according to the, to UL. But this should maybe uh, end any debates before they start. You can definitely use them. The last change in Article 230 is, depending on where you live, is either nothing. You're, you're gonna you're gonna see this change and be like, well, I thought that was already required. We've been doing that for a hundred years. Or you're going to read this and it's going to stop your Earth from spinning. 230.85 emergency disconnect. New requirement for an exterior disconnect for one and two family dwellings is now required. Okay, uh, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. My house has a service disconnect on the outside. Every house that I have ever inspected, and I was an inspector for 17 years, I think, every house that I ever inspected had a service disconnect on the outside. That's just how it's done here. And in the states surrounding me, that's how it's done. When I travel out of the state, however, usually all you have on a house is what? A meter on the outside, and then some cable going in, supplying a panel on the inside. Well, that's not something you're going to see anymore. Now your area is going to look a lot more like my area. So for one and two family dwellings, a readily accessible outdoor disconnect that disconnects the service conductors is now required. Okay, so you need to walk up to this house, be able to shut it off from the outside. Now, this panel board, as you can see, is, is a combination unit. It has the meter, and then in there it has a service disconnect. Um, only one service disconnect, right? Not two to six in the same enclosure. We know that's not allowed anymore. So one service disconnect, walk up, shut it down. Why is it important that I can do this? Well, it's important for first responders and mainly firefighters, let's be honest. So if firefighters need to throw water on this house, they need to be able to shut off the power and they don't wanna get involved with a utility and everything else. So if there's an emergency and somebody needs to shut off the power, what are they going to do? They're either going to, you know, hopefully they, they've got a switch out here and they can just shut it off. If they don't, then they're either going to do what? They're either gonna call the utility or they're going to have to rip the meter out while it's energized. And let me tell you something, that is one of the most dangerous things that we can do. Because when you pull that thing out while it's under load, you are creating a series arc. Right? I'm not saying you will create, it absolutely will happen. I'm not saying it could, it will happen. You're creating a series arc and the amount of current on that arc is pretty substantial. And there have been some documented arc flash incidents that have occurred from people removing or reinserting the meters while it's energized. So we shouldn't be forcing our firefighters to deal with an arc flash incident in addition to a building that's on fire. Nobody deserves that much adventure in their life. So they need to be able to walk up and shut it down. The disconnect can be one of, I think, three options. Although number one, I think, is the one you're gonna see. The disconnect can be one or more service disconnects that's marked emergency disconnect, service disconnect. Okay, so outside, you walk out to the panel, you've got your two pole 100, you shut it off, right next to it you got the sticker, emergency disconnect, service disconnect, that's it. In my opinion, that's probably going to be the easiest way of satisfying this requirement. This is the, the method that I see all day every day around me and I think it's gonna be the method that you start seeing around you. There are other options. I can use a meter disconnect. Now, I have never seen, and to be honest, I've never even heard of a meter disconnect at a house. This thing in the photograph is not a meter disconnect. This is a meter bypass. So let's be very clear on that. A meter bypass is not a meter disconnect. A meter disconnect shuts off the power, right? A meter bypass does the exact opposite. A meter bypass leaves it on. So what else can I use? I can use the service disconnect or I can use one or more meter disconnect that's marked emergency disconnect, meter disconnect, not service equipment, it's a mouthful, or item three, other listed disconnect switches or circuit breakers on the supply side of the service disconnect that's suitable for use as service equipment and is marked emergency disconnect, not service equipment. So again, I think the option that you're going to be seeing in most applications 
is a panel board with a single service disconnect in it, shut it off, that's your emergency disconnect. All right, so that's what we have to look forward in the 2020 edition of the NEC as it relates to Article 230. I plan on doing a lot more of these videos on the 2020 code as we, uh, as we start to learn more and more about it and, and as the ink dries in the actual code book. But there were a lot of people talking about Article 230 specifically, so I wanted to take the time and do a quick little video on it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something from it. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and uh, and type them out or get in touch with me via email if you'd like to do it that way. Thanks for watching.